Hey, good morning. Welcome to Monday Morning Live. This is Donna Lewis. It's been a little while. Um, been recovering from all of the moving. Uh, we're finally getting to a place where we're pretty settled. And welcome to my new studio. This is the, the basement. We've been looking for a house with a workable basement. It seems like forever and we finally found one. Uh, so it's been pretty exciting to get things set up. Jade actually even got his drum kit set up again. I'll show you some pictures uh, after the broadcast. Well, uh, today's topic is uh, comes out of the book of James. And I've been, with my daily devotions, I've been studying the book of James. And as I was looking at it just yesterday, actually, I was in the chapter four uh, of James, and um, it really occurred to me that that whole chapter perfectly describes narcissistic behavior. The, when I look at narcissistic behavior, I look at pathological levels of selfishness and being self-absorbed, but it really goes deeper than that. And I'm no psychologist. It's just, I've been uh, over the years doing quite a bit of studying on the subject just because this particular behavior pattern has dramatically impact, impacted my own life and uh, caused a lot of um, pain in my own life. And as I've met other people who have experienced um, damaging relationships from this particular behavior pattern. Um, we all seem to have, share a common thread in our, in our experience. Um, some would argue that narcissism is impossible to cure. But, you know, I would argue that narcissism can be cured because, believe it or not, my friends, I believe we all have the propensity to become extremely narcissistic. Some of you may disagree. Some of you may agree. But I believe that narcissism is really just the human condition unchecked. Paul writes that there's no sin that overtaken us that isn't common to man. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, if, you, if we think about it, we all want to say things like, oh, I would never do that. You know, we see some, some kind of horrible um, murder take place or some sort of horrible... Um, scheme that robs people of tons and tons of money, their, their entire life savings or their entire retirement. Um, we see, um, you know, mass shootings or, or other just really wicked behaviors. And we want to distance ourselves from that and say, oh, I would never do that. Well, I believe that as human beings, there really isn't anything that we aren't capable of doing. And if we distance ourselves from hurtful behavior and say, well, gee, I would just never do that, well, then we're deceiving ourselves. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing to a degree off subject here and, and taking a little bit of a rabbit trail that, I don't know, let me just pose the question. Do you think there is something you would never do? I commit adultery or um, steal or lie or, um, I don't know, um, harm an animal. <laughs> um, I, I personally take the position that I am perfectly capable of committing any kind of sin that is on the books. If it's a sin, I believe I'm capable of committing it. 
the reason I go there is because I feel like if I don't acknowledge that I am capable of committing any atrocity, any sin, any selfish behavior that's out there, that's the first te step towards committing that atrocity. That's the first step towards actually doing the thing I hate. If I acknowledge that I am perfectly capable of doing that, then first off, I'm not so quick to judge somebody who has done it. And secondly, I'm taking a step backwards from that sin rather than towards it. But again, I think I'm digressing to a degree. We're talking about narcissism. Like I said, the quick definition for me with narcissism is pathological selfishness. Selfishness that has just gone to the next level. Let's look at the book of James. James chapter 4. What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires. Sounds a lot like narcissism to me. You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. <laughs> you scheme with envy and harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and fight. And all the time, you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. And if you ask, you won't receive it for you're asking with corrupt motives, seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. You have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair, an unholy relationship with the world. Don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover? who intensely desires to have more and more of us. But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us, for it says, God resists you when you are proud, but continually pours out grace when you are humble. So then, surrender to God, stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will turn and run away from you. Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer to you. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning and your joy into deep humiliation. Be willing to meet, be made low before the Lord and he will exalt you. Dear friends, as part of God's family, never speak against another family member. For when you slander a brother or sister, you violate God's law of love and your duty is not to make yourself a judge of the law of love by saying that it doesn't apply to you, but your duty is to obey it. So I read almost the entire chapter. There's more there, but I, I just wanted to stop there. Yesterday when I was reading this, I really got to be, I, I really got to be thinking about narcissism narcissism within my own self, the propensity to become self-absorbed, um, uh, 
full of ambition. Um, and I realized that what happens to us as human beings is really perfectly laid out by Paul in the book of Romans, where he talks about how God gives you over to a depraved mind. You see, we're all born selfish. We're all born wanting what we want for ourselves. And then, for some of us, we get beat up so bad, and our ability to feel shame becomes weaponized against us. See, we're all born with the ability to feel bad when we do harm for some, to someone, right? But then that feeling of guilt and remorse is used against us in some way. And then we want to shut ourselves off and protect our heart from feeling that horrible pain. But it's that pain that we need to keep us compassionate and empathetic towards other people so that we don't just go around hurting people and not caring. What happens to a person who could be diagnosed with narcissistic personality is they hate that feeling of shame so much that they'll do anything to avoid feeling it. They'll, they'll lie so they'll accuse another person of lying. They'll be jealous, so they accuse someone else of being jealous. That way it's on that person, not them, right? But we all do that to a small degree, right? I mean, I've done it, I, and I think if we're all honest, we'll all be willing to admit, yeah, I've done that in some way. I've said, yeah, but, yeah, I did that, but so-and-so did it first, or... I wouldn't have done it if they hadn't done this first, right? Um, so where am I going with all this? The title of today's subject, Is There a Cure for Narcissism? I believe there is. I believe there is. But it, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. It doesn't feel good to realize that we've done something wrong, right? When we steal something, the last thing we want to do is cop to it. When we tell a lie, the last thing we want to do is tell the truth about what we've done. If we've been talking behind somebody's back and saying some mean things or unkind things, um, you know, airing somebody's dirty laundry, we don't want to admit we're doing that. Because why? Because we know it's wrong and it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It doesn't feel good. But it's that very pain that we have to feel in order to get healthy again. You see, one of the things that I realized yesterday when I was reading the book of James is that in going ahead and allowing ourselves to experience the pain of embarrassment, 
the pain of shame, of exposure. We, we, we walk towards the truth. And what did Jesus say? I, Jesus speaking of himself, I am the truth. Right? He's the word of God made flesh and bone. He is truth. So when we go ahead and say, yeah, I was gossiping about you. Yeah, those words did come out of my mouth. Yeah, I did steal that. We feel that horror of pain. We feel the embarrassment of coming fully exposed on what we've done. But then God's resurrection life comes in and he says, okay, now that you've told the truth, I, I'm going to remove that from you and put it on me at the cross and I'm going and I'm going to give an exchange for that my purity and I'm going to wipe the slate clean like it never happened we can truly be set free but the truth has to come first see James even said it let your laughter and joking around hey good morning carolyn be turned to mourning and sorrow when we distance ourselves from the truth if okay so let's say this is jesus and this is us right when we acknowledge and tell the truth, we walk closer and closer towards Jesus, right? But when we refuse to acknowledge the truth, we pull back further and further and further from Jesus, further and further from life, further and further from healing, further and further from a sound mind, right? All that we need is right here in Jesus. Life, truth, health, healing, soundness of mind. The further we walk away from that, the more we get into depravity, the harder we become. And I really firmly believe that that's what we're seeing happening in the world today. It's almost as though narcissism is epidemic. It's, it's almost worse than this COVID virus. It is worse. This COVID virus walks into a room and decimates it, right? People walk, the interesting thing about COVID is people will walk around with it for weeks without even knowing they have it, right? And then they'll be infecting everyone, thinking they're just fine, right? That's the scary thing about COVID. Narcissism works the same way, folks. Hey, Tammy, good to see you, girl. Narcissism works the same way. We think we're just fine. We think we're, we, we, we want to believe we're all that in the bag of chips. We want to believe we are the righteousness of God, right? But meanwhile, we're infecting people with our selfishness. We're infecting people with our deception. Because why? Because we refuse to come in to the truth and acknowledge and feel the pain of what we have done. And then 
we go a step further and we spiritualize it. Well, well God forgives me. Yeah, Jesus took our sin on the cross, but what is his precondition for receiving that? Confess, come into the truth, feel the pain. Experience the shame, go ahead and feel it, go ahead and experience it, allow it to, to watch over you. <coughs> Excuse me. Not the shame that's weaponized and condemns and um, not that. There, the, the pain I'm talking about is the genuine, authentic, oh my gosh, that was just so bad when I, I, when I told that lie. And when I told that lie, it caused this person damage, it, and it caused this person damage. And when I, when I gossiped about my friend behind her back, it made her feel terrible. It made her feel low and small and ashamed. And I promised her I would never share this, and then I did. And it, I, I, I wish I hadn't done that. That's the kind of pain I'm talking about, allowing yourself to feel. It's not the shame that says, you're the worst sinner that ever lived, you don't deserve to live, you should crawl under a rock and die. That's condemnation. And it's completely unproductive. It leads to death. In other words, it makes you want to run from it and never experience the shame that is authentic remorse for having harmed another person with your actions. One leads to life, and we must allow ourselves to feel and embrace that if we're ever going to be healed. The other will lead to death because it leads you to want to run into more deception. As a society, I fear that we have gone almost completely into quarantine against shame. Nobody wants to feel shame for anything anymore. If we're living an unhealthy lifestyle we're, and, and somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, I noticed this and I'm really concerned about your health and well-being right now. Maybe you want to think about not drinking so much alcohol. Oh, we're shaming that person, right? <laughs> no, I, I'm just genuinely concerned about their liver, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if you bring it to their attention, you're shaming them. Um, we're, we're almost running in, we're almost, we're quarantining against shame. We're giving it a bad name. And there, there, is a, there is a reason God allows us to feel shame. It's, it's no different than allowing us to feel the burn of a hot stove or the heat as we come close to it. Good morning, Tiffany. He wants us to know that there is behavior out there that is going to harm us and harm others if we engage in it. And he also wants us to share in the pain that we cause others, right? He says, love your neighbor 
as yourself, right? How can we love our neighbor as ourself if we refuse to allow ourselves to feel pain when we cause them pain? Right? The cure, I believe, for narcissism is shame. We need godly sorrow over things we have done or are doing that are good for nothing. Amen, Tammy. Absolutely. Good morning, Tim. Please jump in and share your thoughts on this subject. I am eager to hear them, and I'll read them out loud. Um, please, um, this, is, uh, this is an open discussion. That's the beauty of Facebook Live. So share your thoughts. Share your insights. Share your personal experience. You know, when I was growing up, shame was weaponized in my family. And when I say weaponized, we were made to feel ashamed over foolish things, ashamed over foolish things. Um, and therefore, any kind of criticism became a death sentence for me. It, if, if, if somebody needed to give me any kind of criticism at all, it, it felt like they were taking my head off. Um, I would have rather faced a firing squad than to be criticized over anything. And I knew that wasn't good. I knew that I, because, because why? Because of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs teaches us wisdom that, that we need criticism in our life to live. The type of criticism that makes us better human beings, right? We need people to mirror back to us what we're doing because we don't have that ability to see everything. We'll either, we'll either be too hard on ourselves or let ourselves off the hook too quickly, right? One or the other. We're people of extremes. When we have our brothers and sisters to come around us, it helps us give a, get a realistic view. You know, in Hebrews, it talks about how God disciplines the sons he loves. And if he doesn't discipline us, then we're not his children. But his, his discipline is always instruction. His, his correction is always with the motivation to bring you closer and closer to life and life to the full right it isn't this you idiot what's wrong with you no it's hey hey donna girl i love you so much can i please just show you something real quick this little area right here that doesn't want to receive criticism it's going to hurt you Allow people to come in and tell you just a little bit. I promise it'll always be in love. When it's from me, it's always going to be in love. And there's always going to be a way for you to go. Right? It's that. It's that attitude of instruction. It's that attitude of building up, not tearing down. It's, it's, it's the attitude and motive of, man, if... If you just go a little higher here, girl, you're just going to fly like, like an eagle, right? It's always that motive of love. It's that, that cheering on that, yeah, you can go higher, push a little harder, go a little deeper. You can do this, right? But when we run from that pain, 
there's no life there. There's no instruction there. We just get further and further into a depraved mind. I really believe that one reason why so many um, behavioral scientists believe that narcissism is completely incurable is that people that are now living a life at the level that they would be diagnosed with this have gone so deep into a depraved mind that it's going to take a lot to dig them out. But it's not impossible. You take one step towards the light and God's going to draw you deeper than you ever dreamed possible. The Apostle Paul's a perfect example of that. He was so self-righteous, he was killing people, torturing them. But one encounter with the light of life changed all of that forever. So anyway, I would encourage you all to just dive into James 4. Um, and start with, with right here. What's, what's going on inside of me? You know, it, I think one of the problems we face as the body of Christ right now is that we want to draw things out of people's eyes without first looking at our own in the mirror. If, if we refuse to acknowledge that we hide from shame, then we're of no use to anyone else out there. I think that's where self-righteousness happens, you know. We think we're above it all. But if we acknowledge that, no, no, <laughs> hey, honey, I'm right there with you, girl. I don't like this stuff either. I, I don't want to admit it when I'm wrong. <laughs> um, and no, I'm not any better than you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Right? Um then we can come alongside and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just pointing you in the direction I'm going in, and I see light this way. You want to see it too? Because you can see it too. It's, it's just right there. Um, then we can really start helping people. Then we can start authentically loving people. Because we're, we're, we're loving them from a position of, hey, I'm right there with, with you. Um, anyway, happy Monday. Um, and God bless you. And uh, love you all to pieces. Bye-bye.